Welcome back, everybody. I am really excited to present my special guest today, Dr. Kevin Olson. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, everybody. I want to start by asking you a little bit about your musical background. Do, do you come from a musical family? Yeah. Well, my mom is a piano teacher. She still teaches and she's in her late seventies now and she still has probably 50 students. It's incredible. I have no idea how she does it, but yeah, for me growing up, there were always uh, piano students in the house and, um, and she taught me until I was probably nine or 10 years old. And like happens with most uh, parents of pianists uh, that are piano teachers, they kick their students out, their own kids out. And uh, so I, they sent me to a teacher on the other side of Salt Lake City, and it was the right teacher at the right time. It was fantastic. So, um, yeah, for most of my life, I, uh, uh, as far as I can remember, I was taking piano lessons. What a great thing to grow up in such a musical household. Once you got into that a little bit, how did you get started composing and being creative? Yeah, it was always kind of a natural thing to me. My mom would help me write my first piano pieces. So I, I they go back as far as when I was in uh, kindergarten and first grade. So I would be making wow. some stuff up. And again, as a great piano teacher, my mom understood uh, the importance of encouraging and motivating kids at that age. And so she would help me notate those early pieces. Um, the, the competitions really were inspiring and motivating to me. So, uh, my local school through the PTA had the reflections contest. And so, uh, when the other kids were drawing pictures and doing poems, I was like the only kid writing music at that age and the trophy started coming in. And then it was just addiction at that point. I was just excited about the next, uh, competition and, uh, and those types of things. I'm a very competitive person. Ask my family. We play Scrabble. It gets really intense. So that kind of competition types of thing really motivated me. So I try to do that with my students as well. I think having a, a good deadline, a purpose, and then the great feedback you get from judges. Uh, for me, um, I think that that's just such an important component with a young composer is to encourage those uh, festivals and competitions and things like that. That is excellent advice. I love that. So you touched on it a moment ago, but what are some of the things that challenged you to become a better composer? Yeah, I think when you're composing, you always, whenever a teacher asks me what my favorite composition of my that I've written is, I always say the next one. I'm always just really excited to see what uh, new things I can do. It's, it's a challenge, I think, as a composer to not get in your own comfort zone. I'm, I've certainly uh, fallen into patterns and things like that in pieces, and I really try hard to make the next piece be something I haven't done before, exploring um, maybe a different style or giving myself a compositional challenge. I like giving myself little puzzles to kind of figure out, and in a way, I think that's what helps our young students as well. There's an element of critical thinking where you have to, um, you get yourself in a little box as a composer and you have to find your way out in a, in a, in a way that feels satisfying to you. So that leads perfectly into my next question, which is what role do restrictions play in your composing? I think that's a, a challenge, I think, for any composer. And as you're coaching young composers, I think that's the challenge, right? Is the uh, you're you're thinking about um, whatever the box is, whether it's in a kind of a tonal harmonic language or something much more expansive. I think all composers have had to figure out how to navigate the rules that you put in place for yourself. So there's an element of, I always love this concept of unity and variety in a piece of music. You really kind of have to decide where that perfect balance is to keep an audience engaged and recognizing things that have happened, but then surprising them. And we know as an audience how it feels to be on the other ends of both of those, either something that's way too predictable and boring or something that's so incomprehensible. And the funny thing is, as an audience, we check out either way. We just kind of tune out whether something's too boring or too strange. And so now what we define as boring and strange, of course, is very personal. But I think as a composer, I'm always factoring that in. At that very moment where I'm writing, where am I in that dial? Am I kind of bordering on being a little bit too predictable? Is my audience ready for something new? Or have I just challenged them with something a little bit... um, uh, 
uh, uncomfortable and I might need to throw them a bone, I guess you could say, of, of something that they will have remembered and to, to tap in that power of memory that's so important when we listen to music. So it's being engaged, I think, in the moment where you are in that uh, spectrum. And like I said, it's different for everybody, but I think that's where a lot of young students get kind of um, stuck or frustrated is that they get they introduce their themes and then they're ready to do something else and then they do something else. And I really like to have students think about getting the most mileage out of the least amount of material. In other words, thinking like Bach or Beethoven, how they were able to take one motive and stretch that out to um, two, three, five 10, 20 pages worth of material. So a lot of times with modern notation, the, the aspect of inserting maybe 20 measures and saying, I'm going to force myself to keep this material before I move on to something interesting and, and different. I think there's a discipline in that as well. So it's, it's a fun challenge. You mentioned it a moment ago, and I've had the opportunity to teach and play a lot of your music. And there's this huge breadth and variety in what you've written, which I love. But there's also some certain things, and it's difficult to put my finger on what it is, but it is your sound. It's your unique compositional style. What are the things that you did that you feel help you, helped you to figure out what that style was and to help discover that? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is is kind of in your just cultural DNA, what you grow up with. So, for example, I'm a child of the 80s. And so I grew up listening to all the pop music. I loved all of that stuff. I was playing Beethoven and Mozart, but I was listening to The Police and I was listening to Michael Jackson and all of that kind of stuff. And it kind of integrated into my DNA that way. And then when I was a freshman in high school, I joined the the high school jazz band and started really getting into, uh, you know, listening to Bill Evans and listening to um, George Shearing and Duke Ellington and Count Basie and all these great jazz pianists. So analyzing a little bit of that kind of sound got me thinking about uh, some of those uh, chord voicings and things like that. So yeah, for me, I really, um, I think for all composers, it probably is a combination of what you hear what you gravitate toward. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of it comes from, whether I intend it to be or not. How do you as a composer avoid some of the common compositional pitfalls of getting past that blank page syndrome or starting a million things but never finishing anything? Yeah, I think that's a, a really a tricky kind of thing. We, I spend a lot of time with my own students uh, kind of getting past that point and, and uh, thinking about what I call compositional starters. So for me, you know, if you think about composition as maybe an exercise or an etude, the same way that maybe you would practice uh, Hannon or Schmidt or something like that, um, you can do that same kind of thing with composition. You can tell yourself, okay, I'm going to sit at the piano, maybe in a very easy stage, I'm only going to play pieces with black notes and see what I can do to incorporate that. When you get a little bit more advanced, you can start to think about, OK, I'd like to write a piece that's in 5-4 time and let me play around with the E flat major scale. And uh, so now you're kind of giving yourself a little bit of these parameters to work with. Um, then you get maybe into things like modes or whole tone scale or something that maybe you're experiencing in a piece that you're playing. There are students that don't need a lot of those, um, but I think for most students, that's that's the place to start, is either a technical kind of starting point, or another way for me is I also have just a list in my computer here of hundreds of titles. When I'm just in, in the, not in the mood to compose, but I've just got images and titles in my mind, sometimes that's a place for, for me to start and to think about, okay, a constellation, what would a, what would a starry landscape feel like to me on the piano? and start to, to, to go from that. So I think whether it's coming from maybe a verbal or an, uh, an imagery or maybe just a purely musical technical kind of thing, um, having a, a starting place that is really actually thought out and not just, um, you know, I'm just gonna start playing notes, um, I think can often, often really help.
you've led me perfectly into something else that I was hoping you would touch on today, and that is kind of how teachers who want to start teaching composition, but they're a little bit hesitant to kind of get into that, might do that. And and you have these awesome books that you wrote with Wynne Ann Rossi called Music by Me, which I think it serves as a phenomenal framework for getting students going in composition. Can you talk a little bit about the Music by Me series, please? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I I actually strongly believe that composition needs to come from improvisation. Um, I think uh, there are some, for example, uh, music theory textbooks or maybe things that are integrated in methods where a student might maybe from a more academic standpoint be filling in missing notes or there's something that that they're doing that's maybe correct or not. And there's a purpose for that. But I think when you're really getting into true, authentic uh, composition, it always has to come through uh, improvisation. So I think what Win Ann and I tried to really do in this book, instead of making a bunch of theory exercises, is to take a concept and take it from start to finish, which is uh, introducing, it's kind of a four page unit. Uh, you introduce maybe a new concept like mixed meter or pan diatonicism or whole tone scales. The first thing we do is just kind of talk about it a little bit, maybe give a few examples. So you're modeling. Then the second, which is maybe the most important, is that there are these um, improvisation uh, starters where uh, students really aren't worried about writing notes down and things like that, but they're just getting, they're starting to explore the sounds of, of what they're doing there. And then we move into a little bit of the notation process and then they complete the piece at the end of each unit. Even if teachers don't decide to give their students these books individually, what we hope is that there are um, ideas and starter points that you can have. So after five books of these with uh, seven or eight units in each book, you've got uh, 30 to 40 ideas when your student does say, hey, I want to compose, or maybe you really want to give them an improvisation challenge. Um, now you've got a bunch of ideas as a teacher to to take that. But if you take them all the way to the final product, uh, they've actually got a bunch of pieces that they could submit that are completely their own. They're not uh, imitations or homework assignments, but they're they're They've come from start to finish from the students' own ideas. That's excellent. Well, I would highly recommend the books. They're just phenomenal and a great way for teachers who are looking to get going in composition, but maybe don't quite know where to start. So Mm -hmm. thank you for taking time to talk about those. Yeah, they work really well. They work in um, one-on-one lessons, but I've done, for example, summer composition camps. Uh, and it requires no prep work. If you have your students come each day on, in a summer, uh, you could actually have them get one of the books and each day go through a process and um, kind of the easiest little summer composition camp you might ever do because all the work's done in those books. When Ann said the same exact thing when I interviewed her last week. So what do you feel is one of the biggest challenges that composers today are facing? There's a purely uh, kind of functional challenge, kind of an existential challenge, obviously, in the world of, um, of composition, which is um, the way that I think in, a, in a, the commercial setting, it's become so difficult for publishers to... Um, uh, to invest in new creative ideas. I think there's um, there's all sorts of logistics with um, with just the online availability. And, and I think music has become so disposable. That's the word I'm trying to look for, is that there's, there's a way that we feel that, and whether this is recorded music or, or published music, it's so easy now to produce that I think it becomes a real challenge, I think, for people to invest in it. And I think for a composer that's trying to do this in a commercial setting, that becomes very challenging, especially if there are uh, uh, publishers that um, maybe aren't accepting as much new material as they might in the past. Now, with every challenge comes an opportunity. And I think the opportunity now we're seeing is the accessibility of self-publishing and this way that we as publishers maybe can take back a little bit of control or power over our own creative work instead of the old days where we had to maybe beg a publisher to get anything out there to the world. Now there's all sorts of ways that we can do that. Of course, that requires a lot more um, hustle on a composer's uh, own time. So you have to be willing to maybe make the effort to get your word out there, use social media to, to advertise, have a really good website. 
So when young composers come to me and ask me about kind of getting in the publishing world, I actually really challenge them to maybe look at this other option because there are lots of composers who are very successful um, in their ways of self-promoting and retaining most of the control of their own works, developing a name, and then not relying on somebody else to be doing that. So yeah, with every challenge comes an opportunity. And I think that's, uh, that's the one that maybe is facing a lot of composers today, which is maybe this idea that we can uh, use technology to our advantage and, and, uh, and flip the script a little bit on what's made it difficult to be a composer. What are some of the pros and cons that you see of the new trend toward digital publishing and eBooks? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, a, a pro really can be that you have more creative control over your final work. Um, as much as I have enjoyed the, the, the experiences I've had with various publishers throughout the decades that I've been doing it, I'll be honest in saying that sometimes it's difficult having something that might be highly edited. So um, an editor that may, you know, even though you feel really strongly creatively that something needs to happen, editors with the best intentions are, start, are thinking, well, is this going to sell? Or does this fit the, the demographic of our uh, customers the best? So they have a different maybe intention than you have as a composer. With that said, I will say that I've learned so much from editors throughout the years. Um, looking at my very early pieces and really not thinking as a teacher as much to a more pedagogical focused, um, how can this piece really work with a, a, a student at a certain level? How can you use patterns that are easily recognizable? How do you make a piece sound harder than it really is? Those kind of things I have definitely learned through the editing process. But I have to admit that it's very uh, liberating to sometimes go out and do my own thing without any uh, restrictions and um, and page numbers and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it requires the composer to get uh, really good at engraving, uh, to be able to do their own recordings, to have a nice functional website. But, you know, this generation of young composers, I don't think are scared about those types of things. So as long as they can get that kind of training into how to write music that is really um, accessible and satisfying uh, to their audience, um, it can be a really successful model. I've noticed that some of the people who are pub publishing digitally are still working with traditional editors and music engravers, but some just as clearly are not. And it's kind of the, uh, one of my guests earlier last week commented that it's, it's sort of the wild west of music publishing at this point. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's really helpful is since that gatekeeping from the publishers is kind of beginning to go away a little bit, that there are organizations that have repertoire lists that hopefully direct teachers to high quality music, such as your composition. So right. thank you. Well, yeah, that's what's so exciting about, you know, always these federation bulletins are, um, are huge for composers. This is a, a great opportunity to connect with maybe teachers that wouldn't know you otherwise. And I've been so grateful throughout the years about the federation and other List. I know there's a lot of work that goes into that. And being on the other side, I also teach about 18 or 19 pre-college students. And as teachers, we really rely on those lists as well. They become very important uh, places where we can uh, discover new music, but sometimes even rediscover old music that we've forgotten about. So um, I'm really, yeah, I'm also very grateful as a teacher for those lists. Dr. Kevin Olson, thank you so much for sharing your time, your wisdom, your expertise, all the insights that you've shared with us today. I am so truly grateful to you. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you, Sam, for all you're doing. We appreciate you too. Thanks.